work on it. Got it. <laughs> um, my doctoral dissertation project, the Geneva Beatus, in its southern Italian context, concentrates on the Geneva Beatus as a whole manuscript with the two special focuses on its southern Italian context or like origin and its illuminations. I know that some uh, people here in the audience are familiar with the Beatus topic, but for maybe the few who aren't, I will give you a very short summary. And now I cannot, short summary. The Beatus uh, manuscript tradition is a tradition of commentaries on the apocalypse of John, written by the monk Beatus of Liabana, probably situated at the Liabana monastery, in the kingdom of Asturia, which is uh, today northern Spain, like a part of northern Spain. You can see it here. The map is unfortunately a bit not as sharp as I wish to be, but you get the idea. Around the year 776, the monk published the first edition of his commentary on the apocalypse. Today, we assume that there have been two later editions. Uh, one thought to have been made by Beatus himself in 784, and one probably published uh, published posthumously, uh, probably around 940 or a little earlier. And I'm referring here to the newest edition of the Beatus text by Greisen. What is especially important to me as an art historian is that the commentary is not only illuminated, but probably has been so from the start on. So probably already the first one or the first editions uh, were already um, illuminated, even though probably a bit like less lavishly than the later ones. Um, the text of the commentary is divided into 12 books and uh, 68 sections. The storia, these sections are followed, uh, like each of it is followed by an explanatio, the actual commentary. In between the storia and the like, commentary, the illuminations are inserted. The text follows the Vetus Latina. And for its uh, for his commentary, Beatus leaned on different early exegetical texts, and very famously, the Tuconius Apocalypse commentary around like fourth century in North Africa, like most of you will probably know. Regarding the illuminations, generally and really very briefly, uh, one could say that there are two main branches. Branch one and branch two, which with like the first one obviously being the old one and uh, branch two, the revised one. This revision has probably happened in the beginning of the 10th century and the branch one illuminations are often described as being less complex, inserted into the two column layout without frames and painted directly onto the vellum. The branch two illuminations contrast in being bigger, often filling an entire page or even crossing over to the adjacent page and more complex. They are also painted against a multicolored background and are sometimes framed or like most of them are framed. The core of the illuminations uh, consists more or less um, around 74 illuminations with the newer ones having up to 108 illuminations. While uh, a world map uh, was probably already part of the first Beatus because he comments on it, uh, the later copies added, for example, sometimes a Noah's Ark, which you can see on the left side, or even images of the evangelists and gospels. And as you can also see, sometimes um, a genealogy of Jesus, or also the famous Oviedo cross and different other uh, symbolic motives. Um, then we have a few copies that have not been made in Spain. Um, we have all together, we have 29 illuminated manuscripts left. And like I said, four of them have not been made in Spain. 
First of all, we have the Saint Sever Beatus, um, the Berlin Beatus, and a very interesting Milan fragment. <laughs> and uh, then what is what I call what I call my copy, the Geneva Beatus. As you can see, most of them circle around like the mid and the like end of the 11th century which is probably very interesting the last three ones are all made in southern italy which is also very interesting um <clears throat> the geneva beatus has been located to southern italy because of its combination of carolingian and beneventan scripts and because of the writing and the illuminations it was dated around the mid 11th century. The text is closest to those of the branch one copies, and it is closest to the copies made in San Milan de la Cogola, and again after Grice, and probably also with the Escorial Beatus. The illuminations follow the rough description of the branch one copies. We have smaller illuminations inserted into the text columns, although, as you can see, this format is broken several times, <laughs> and they do not have colored backgrounds or frames. It has 60 illuminations in total, which is still quite a lot, and it is still perceived as a complete one since all of the like canonical important ones are there. Mm -hmm. So, interestingly, the illuminations have probably been inserted first, and then the text secondly. Even more important, it seems as if the copy, uh, this copy, also has some illuminations which have been reinvented by the illuminator, but I'll come to that later. Um, for a very long time, the Beatus tradition has been viewed as a tradition of very like true to the text um, illuminations and especially true to the Bible text illuminations, which in recent years has been um, challenged, uh, has been challenged more often, especially from Richard K. Emerson, for example, um, which is also why I am very interested to implement this into my um, project. Therefore, what I am especially interested in in my illuminations is, do the illuminations strive from the Bible text? And if so, where are the changes? How are they made? And is there a textual reference, either given the commentary or like based on some um, medieval standards in the sense of, is there a specific way of illuminating a specific Bible part or a figure in the middle of the 11th century slash Southern Italy, or also in the Southern Italian way of portraying apocalyptic motifs and so on. Also, do the illuminations of the manuscript have designs made in a way where one can see a sign of like patristical, exegetical influence, to throw in the bad word, <laughs> in addition to the commentary? which brings me to methods and examples, the fun part. Um, first of all, um, as art historians, <laughs> we uh, still view images uh, in a very classical way after Panofsky. Um, <laughs> and I threw uh, on the on the slide the like the Slack like, system. I'm very sorry that it isn't German because it's from a very own copy scan, so it's unfortunately German. But it's basically a three step system where you look at the picture in front of you, um, and in a first you have three steps. First, you look at it in a very um, in a very reduced way of like just describing what you see and nothing else then in a second step you add um your um source knowledge and your literary knowledge um and interpret the what you're seeing in an iconographic way and then in the third step you implement additionally everything um from like that you know in the sense of like um human history and how are certain sujets 
um, painted throughout and like per perceived in uh, human history and changing of times and certain cultures and like uh, contexts. So this is the very brief description of it. <laughs> but coming to my first example. Um, I want firstly to start with the opening of the first four seals, the four horsemen. Um, here we can see like very clearly four horsemen. They are portrayed quite big for this manuscript and are arranged in two and two in both columns. Especially the left two ones do break out of their column like a lot. Um, with the lower one even reaching out into the right column. But you can see that, can you see my little hand? You can see that here, for example, like the horse. Um, they are portrayed to be read clockwise, starting with the upper left one. Overall, it seems that the right two ones are way more compressed into the right part of the folio. We can see here clearly what I mentioned earlier regarding the illuminations being made firstly and the text inserted later. The upper two figures seem to interact with each other while the lower left uh, has an accompanying figure with it. But all in all, uh, the second, third and fourth figure do not seem to interact with each other. Let's start with inscriptions. Um, I will read them to you. You can see and follow them in these little fancy squares that I made. <laughs> um, each figure is labeled with an inscription next to them. The upper left rider with the inscription above its head reads Predicator, probably for Predicator, and Equus Albus left next to it. Uh, the upper right one with Diabolus above its head and Equus Rufus to his right. Um, then the lower right one has Diabolus written next to its head, cramped in between the space between the head of its own horse and the hooves of the upper one. And to his right, next to its torso, equus niger is written. Next to the last rider's head on the right side, there is mors to the left. Into the space between him and his accompanying figure, there is written equus pallidus. And on the very left, there is another one reading infernus next to the additional figure accompanying the rider. Generally, the inscriptions here follow quite true to the Bible text. The first rider is the white one with a bow and a crown and is inscribed accordingly. Unclear, for now, is the edition of Predicator. The second rider is the one with a red horse, which is uh, which the inscription does follow. What is different here, though, is the line Diabolus that is uh, given to the writer. This is not included into the Bible text that just reads in translation. Uh, and there went out another horse that was read. And to him um, that said thereon, it was given that he should take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And a great sword has given to him. The inscription Diabolus is not mentioned here in the Bible text, but was added in the commentary. The third rider on the black horse with the scales is also described with the color of its horse, good, and an additional Diabolus that is, again, not in the actual Storia. Uh, storia. Um, the fourth rider on the pale horse is, again, also accompanied with an inscription regarding uh, his horse, and he's also further named as Mors, which is, in this case, again, according to the Bible text. Um, I will cite for shortly, uh, and behold a pale horse and he that sat upon him, his name was death and hell followed him. The figure behind Moors is also described with an inscription that reads Infernus, which is again, according to the Bible text. Here, we can see that even though the inscriptions mainly further describe the figures, it is staying true to the text. There are also two descriptions added that are not in the storia, but uh, in the storia, but rather come from the commentary itself. Uh, if the inscriptions are a later edition, they might indicate a purpose for a better understanding of the illumination. Now, coming to the topic of the like design, I called it uh, of the miniatures. 
here I want to lay emphasis on two things. First, we can see from having a very brief look at the miniatures, that we see a distinction between the first and the other three writers. While the first rider is indeed described in the Storia as riding on a white horse and wearing a crown, which he also does here, he is still in contrast to the other riders. His crown does not show any other rather peculiar further elements like the headdress uh, of the second rider next to him. He does not have a spiky beard or hair. Also, his dress is bright blue, while the other figures are dressed in a rather thick or like darker colors, I called it. Additionally, the two first riders are seemingly in interaction with each other. The first rider has his bow not only with him, but it seems as if he's drawing his body actively in the direction of the second rider, while the second rider is lifting his spear towards the first rider in an, uh, with an astonishingly grumpy facial expression, I called it. In Beata's explanatio to the storia and the illumination, he follows Saint uh, Jerome's edition of the commentary on the apocalypse by Victorinus. And I'm citing here where the first writer is an allegorical figure representing the preachers of the faith. John Williams explains that his white horse and the arrow symbolize the words of his message and the crown he wears is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Here, the white horse's rider um, is a champion of the word of God against the other riders. There are other commentaries where there's actually a fight depicted between the first two riders. You can see that here. <laughs> I would not say um, that we do have an actual fight scene in that sense here in the Geneva Beatus. But I would definitely argue the miniaturist did lay an emphasis on this part of the commentary. Unclear to me as of now is why the sword that is clearly described in the Storia is here exchanged um, with a like, very long, thin spear. Another thought to add here is the fact that Beatus interprets the other three horsemen, not only literally, but reads them allegorically in the spiritual plane, as Williams again describes it. The second rider is to be seen as future wars of church against church. The third rider is hunger for the world, uh, for the word of God. And the fourth as revelation of the false prophets who kill spiritually. This could also be an explanation why the illumination is quite, quite like reduced to the actual writers without showing any clear signs of like added horrors or violence even. Even Moore's additional figure is albeit hellishly designed with his predominant red and plum color, spiky hair, long beard and flames coming out of his mouth, but not fulfilling any like actual cruelty. The added inscriptions to the writers give the viewer an additional description and association. So one can understand that the first one is actually a preacher, as we saw, uh, of the faith, uh, and the others are devils, so like kind of like the bad guys. Um, to summarize here, with this illumination, we do have inscriptions that would be true to the Bible text, but also um, ones that are added and come from the commentary. The illumination itself is also rather accordingly to the Bible text. We do have the added emphasis on the first rider being like, different than the others. For example, like, smoother, like, but cleaner. Also very bright, not only because of the white horse, but also the light clothing and the two first riders seemingly maybe <laughs> being in a fight with each other. Also, we do not have a focus on the cruel aspect of the last three riders, which could be an artistic interpretation of Beata's emphasis on seeing the riders bringing horrors of the spiritual kind. Which also brings us to my second example, 
the opening of the sixth seal, the earthquake. Here, we have an illumination in the lower part of the page, like the folio, breaking the layout of the page with illuminations being strictly embedded into the two column system. The bigger part of it being the end of the folio on the left side with three figures on the left, a little architecture with arches right next to them and above it, again, shifted a bit more to the right, another illumination consisting of for now, I called it like geometrical figures. Clearly, we can see that the illuminations break out of their column quite strongly and are dominating the end of the folio. We see the three richly dressed figures on the far left seemingly in conversation or at least in some way interacting with each other. By the way, they look at each other, especially the figure on the far left and the middle one, and the way the hands were placed as if in conversation with each other. All of them are wearing a bright gold crown right next to them, overlapping with them. We see the little arch, uh, arched architecture or rather four thin arches coloring, colored brightly and decorated lavishly with gold. Again, we have inscriptions um, beginning on the right side between the black and red circles, as I for now called them, um, there is written, Ubi solet luna obscura, ti sunt, ubi stelle de cello padunt in terra. Then, a bit further down, between two of the columns of the arches, ubi reges, magistratus et tribune ab, skonderunt se in speluncis. These are indeed part of the Bible text, describing the opening of the sixth seal, but here, the first few lines omit the earthquake. The detail, like, of the sun turning black and also it misses the uh, turning red of the moon as blood. The stars falling down on earth are mentioned and we can like see them while the figs are omitted again as well as the heaven rolling up the mountains and islands moving around and so on. The second part starts again with the naming of the kings magistrates and tribunes, but amidst the rest of the people mentioned in the Bible text, like the rich and strong, but continues with the hid themselves in caves. So while again, the illumination is described by the Bible text, it again omits the parts that are not shown in the illumination, which together with a placement, seems to indicate that the inscription has been added later. Especially exciting is how, or not now, the illumination itself. We can clearly follow the darkened sun and the reddened sun, also the stars falling down, we can identify. The three figures on the left are identifiable as the kings. They have, like I said, like lavish clothing, a lot of gold crowns, but the rest differs. More importantly, the scene also differs a lot from the established branch one illuminations usually depicted here as seen in the Osma Beatus, which is like branch one, and even in the Morgan Beatus here serving as an example of the branch two illuminations. And you also like already saw those two. Um, we do not have, for example, like Christ depicted, we do not have any angels, no rocks and like general nature, for example, like just like flowery trees. <laughs> um, <clears throat> also, instead of showing the variety of people described in the Bible text, we are only given three figures that look like kings with their sophisticated clothing and crowns. Instead of depicting the described mountains or islands or depicting the nature described in the text, we get four slim and colorful arches with gold. At this point, the commentary helps again. According to Williams, Beatus Explanatio comments as follows. The sun and the moon represent the church within the wise and the ignorant, the falling of the stars, are the faithful, true and false ones. The mountains signify refuge since they are the apostles to whom the kings and powerful, the saints, flee for protection. 
the arches the kings are walking towards are therefore representing the caves from the Bible text, which gets further emphasized via the inscription squished between the right two columns. In comparison with the other manuscripts in its own branch, Osma, but also the later revised copies of the second branch, Morgan, this illumination shows a completely different way of depicting the scene, which is therefore seen as a reinvention of the miniaturist of the uh, Geneva Beatus. Again, we can see here that it is more a uh, reduced scene than the others um, of its like sister manuscripts, if I may say so, which might be a hint towards a theory, again, that the Geneva Beatus could deliberately have been painted in a more reduced, um, like, more reduced way, reduced and like clear to the most necessary, but never in a boring or uninventive way. Maybe following the here Beatus understanding of the apocalypse and the commentary inter interpreting the apocalypse in a spiritual way. Which also, again, brings me to my next thing, which is the conclusion. <laughs> As you could see, all of this uh, is still a very big <laughs> work in progress. For this first presentation, I did choose two very prominent illuminations so that, so that I could show you all that in those cases, the ideas that I have about the Geneva, uh, Geneva illuminations are indeed very plausible and like very good to work with. The inscriptions, both illuminations chosen had them, usually described what could be seen and either adding further understanding or omitting parts of the text that are not shown in the illumination. Also mostly taken from the Bible text, but with additions from the commentary. Both illuminations were depicted rather reduced to um, say that again, and seemingly less complex but simultaneously never in a like boring or uninventive way. Importantly, both of them show clear connections with the commentary. The first, maybe in a less deep way, the second one in a more inventive way. And like I said, maybe following here Beata's commentary interpre interpreting the apocalypse in a spiritual way. Now, the really uh, interesting part uh, and the biggest work for me <laughs> will be getting even deeper into the actual texts, um, the commentary and its sources in comparison with the illuminations, of course, um, but also its closest relatives, textual, the San Milan and the Escorial copies, but also the fur like further comparisons with the other branch one copies. Additionally, the Southern Italian apocalyptic tradition should be further like researched to see if um, if there are visual like new creations, if they have like any connection to their Southern Italian um, context and surroundings, which now, this is the goal <laughs> for this chapter of my dissertational project. And again, already the end of my um, presentation. Thank you so much all for uh, listening, hopefully. <laughs> and I'm excited for your questions. Thank you very much, Francisca, for this uh, engaging uh, and lovely visual presentation of what for many of us is usually just a text, uh, at least for people like me. Uh, so I really appreciate your talk. Um, I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of questions uh, that come to you today. Um, and But while I wait for those to come up and I'm looking here, if you have a question, just uh, use the little Zoom tool 
to indicate uh, a raised hand and I will keep an eye on the list and uh, hand things over to you. Just unmute yourself when I indicate. Uh, and also, I realized that people may be in the comment section, which I have not been attending to. But um, anyway, yeah, just raise your hand and I'll get to you. If I'm not seeing any hands at the first uh, instance here, so why don't I just start with a question? Um, and that would be, what do we know about the uh, the commissioning of whether this this Beatus or the other Italian Beati? Um, are are they coming out of? Uh, are there particular needs that they uh, that these are being produced in order to meet uh, particular clerical needs or liturgical needs or monastic needs? Um, could you um, illuminate uh, yeah. un un unintended pun there? Um, what exactly is going on and how these uh, images are being produced? Why? For whom? Okay, so. Um first to the commission um, part of your question. It is indeed um, more or less a monastic tradition. Um, there is one Beatus that I now just omit my brain, uh, was commissioned by um, Spanish royalty, but except from that one, it is mostly a monastic tradition and being a monastic tradition obviously opens the question what are we like what for what was it needed <laughs> mm -hmm. um which is kind of an interesting topic uh, a topic i also want to hopefully like indulge in but i haven't gotten that far yet so um the usual answer to that is that it was used, like I said, like in a monastic um, context, that it was um, read, um, for example, like in the refectorium or something, to the monks. Um, but there's also hints, um, and I think uh, Harald Buchinger can say more to that, of a, <laughs> of maybe a, like a liturgical, so there's the question of like, has it been used liturgically? Because, because the Hispanic rite has, uh, at some point, I'm, I'm missing my, um, my notes, um, oh, maybe I find it. Um, so, um, there has been the, I think it's the Council of Toledo, please correct me if I'm wrong, I do not want to say anything wrong, um, where they, um, decided to read the Apocalypse, um, between Easter and Pentecost, um, so the question here was also, was it maybe also used for this time in a more liturgical way than just, like, being read out loud to the monks in a like refectory um i also read um but again i do not want to say anything wrong i also read a article by um peter klein who um kind of got to the idea that there's also maybe um hints of it being having like being used as like homilies um so this is an interesting question and something that also like interests me a lot um and i really want to work on that but like i said this is the only things i can say at this point that there are hints of like being used in a different way but uh, nothing else and commissions is always a bit obscure unfortunately except for the one that has clearly been made for like royalty okay okay good Thank you, Francisca. We have uh, three questioners, and I, I wasn't sure the order, but I think Tobias was first, and then Ian, and then Emanuela. So no, I think I think I was second, so it's exactly the order we have here. So Ian, me, and Emanuela. Okay. So Ian, go for it. Hi, thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Francisca. Um, I was very interested to note, I think the questions you raise are fascinating about what are the influences on the art? Are they from the manuscript? Are they from the text? Are they from particular artistic traditions? Um, I, I was struck by the fact that in the picture of the four horsemen, uh, the the 
uh, inscription said Equus Pallidus under the fourth horse, but the color was actually green. And that reflects, I mean, a lot of English translations translate it as a pale horse, but of course in Greek, it's the, it's the, uh, the horse is chloros. So, which is, which is a sort of sickly, sickly green color from which, you know, which get the word chlorine. Um, and I just wondered whether it's possible in that kind of example, whether you can identify that that's artistic evidence of access to particular textual traditions or whether it's influenced by graphical artistic traditions. Because I also noticed that the three kings you illustrated, the three kings were painted the three colors of three of the, three of the four horsemen, as well, or the horses as well. Okay, so um, to the sickly green, <laughs> Um, it's actually, it is an interesting, and this question has also been asked by um, the researchers already having been like slightly dabbling into it, mainly obviously um, John Williams, <laughs> um, but except from like having this question and like noticing this, um, there has not been like an actual answer to this, I think, yet. Um, but it's a good thing. And I was also like struck by that. So I have it like on my brain and I want to find out more about it. So that's very good. Also, I didn't know about the Greek thing. That's a very good thing. Thank you. <laughs> and um, as to the coloring, um, it is really interesting. And I'm probably seeing also Emanuela raising her hand. <laughs> um, so in regards of colors, it's really interesting. So the whole... Um, all of the illuminations have a very strict, very, um, let's say, like a small like range of colors. Um, and while I was describing all of my miniatures, I did try to find out if there is, for example, um, a certain system as in, for example, are angels or like good people uh, being colored in in a certain way and then bad and like quarters um, um, figures in a different way. So does the coloring make uh, another um, uh, like different like levels? Um, but interestingly, no, <laughs> uh, at least like not, uh, I haven't um, concentrated on this question um, as in like an actual topic I'm like I said I'm just like starting out with this whole chapter so um but I did notice it and it was very interesting um but for now I would say that just like the range of colors is just very but that reflects the text of Revelation as well yeah. because some people have argued yeah. that Revelation uses particular colors to describe good and bad and it's simply not true yeah. there's a whole yeah. diversity of colors ascribed to the figures so okay thank you yeah. thank you it uh, at this point, we we happen to have two people here who have recently put together a whole volume on the color green. Um, <laughs> so maybe we can jump directly to them. Uh, uh, Lourdes Garcia Ureña and Emanuela, I think, both contributed to that volume. Do either of you have anything to say about this this green issue? You guys are very well placed to to address that. Okay. Um, okay. Pallidus is the translation in the Vulgata of Chloros. So it's, you know, something that we have in the Bible, in the Latin Bible. So the, the commentary is in Latin and the text is Latin is, and, and it takes into account the Latin text. Mm. So that's, you know, pallidus and pallidus. It's, I know that the color in Greek, in the, you know, the translation is Chloros, but Chloros, it's a very important color in the Bible, in the Greek Bible, because in that case, chloros is linked to the rider. The rider is death, is the death. And the color green is linked to the color of death that is chloros, because according to many medical texts in Greek, chloros, but also prasinos, that is another term in the Bible to say green, they indicate a co the color of the blood in a moment in which an ill person is going to die. So it has a direct link with green color. That's so the rider is the death and the color of that horse is the color of the death. That's why in the book that you mentioned, that is 
just for case here. And uh, the, the, in the book, we said that th this is the connection. I mean, we studied all the medical, not all, but you know, the cases which this, we have example on that. And why and the chloros and Lourdes Garcia Reña made you know more than one article on that. This is the pallidus is the way in which the Latin uh, underlines that in when we die, the man human being die, they lose color. So this is a condition you know going to death or death condition. So this is for pallidus, but just being quick. Uh, Francisca, I, I agree with Jan that, you know, you should look for a sort of language of color in this manuscript, because uh, I think that um, not you, you talk about uh, um, the links between the text and the illuminations, and in one point you said that they possibly the, the, the comments could be a, a way for a better understanding of illuminations. So you should look for these signs of, you know, of traces of color in the comments, and then try to see if there is a language of color. You, we did, you know, you, you talk about a, a small range of colors. This can be for many reasons, but you should also look for a language of color, you know, that is intentional. That's it. Thank you. Anyway, it's really interesting. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, j just to continue on the theme, Lourdes, did you have anything you wanted to contribute on, on green or anything related to the color? Uh, I would like to say that also it's interesting that in this manuscript, in this, in this image, uh, the color of the four horse is similar to a certain green. And I think it's the best time in the Beatus that appear this color because I try, I use the different image uh, for my presentation I, and I uh, found the, the problem that in the Beatus, the fourth horse is not green, neither pallidus. So in this Beatus, we can perceive this new hue that perhaps is related uh, Fran uh, Francisca with um, the Valenciennes apocalypse. Yeah. That I think that perhaps there is a link between them because is the the representation is a bit similar. And also it's interesting that <clears throat> Tertuliano when translate uh, this test or cites the 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 vetus, he uses Uilidis. So it's a, a, a different translation because in the end, they are understanding what uh, Emanuela has explained. But uh, I, I have doubts if the artist uh, knew the commentary of the Beatus because the artist okay. uh, is representing um, is, um, is transforming the Book of Revelation in image because the audience uh, don't know how to read. So it's the way that they understand the Book of Revelation. So I, I am not sure that the artist could uh, read the, the commentaries mm. of the Beatus. And also, I would add that it's true that um, the importance of the copies of the Beatus is not only a liturgical thing, but also is important in Spain because we are living the reconquer, reconquista. I don't know if uh, we are living the the fight with the Muslims. Yeah. So for this reason, it's important to expand. Uh, the book of Revelation, the, co the, the commentary of the Beatus, but also the images. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think that uh, finally uh, the influence of the book were the images. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the commentary is hard for the people in that, in that moment, only for <laughs> the theological people, no? <laughs> 
or the, the priest or the, the because uh, there is also a, a, a controversy between Beatus and the Archiv uh, and the Bishop of Toledo. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, the important, the, the relevance of the Beatus also in that time, it's not um, the commentary, but also the um, to expand or to see the divulgate the message of the Book of Revelation because it has a meaning for the Christian people that are suffering the the fight with the Muslims. Bueno. Good. Let's uh, finally uh, get over to Tobias and your question. And I think Anne had her hand raised, but um, it's gone now. But anyway, Tobias, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Francisca. And maybe we should talk uh, during the next days. Uh, I have two uh, points, which might be interesting on the one hand for you, but maybe also for the group here. One of them uh, is a question that if you speak about the relation of uh, uh, the illuminations to the Bible text. Uh, on the one hand, you can read the illuminations as something which is a reception of the Bible text, but maybe even more interesting could be to see what it means to read the Bible text if you have first the images, which is the thing which you have first in your uh, falling into your eyes, and then what does it mean falling back to your reading of the Bible text? So I think this is a reciprocal relation, and this could make uh, the whole thing even more fascinating. And I'm very happy to talk with you and there's Nathan around and others uh, about this. The second thing is uh, regarding your first uh, image, uh, the, the four riders, uh, maybe for your analysis, it is also interesting to always ask the second question, what is not represented? Mm. So on the first, one of the things is uh, I would expect the four riders or the four horsemen as presented in a row, one, two, three, mm -hmm. four, but they are not presented in a row. You see them all at the same time. Uh, this makes a difference. You say they are uh, arranged clockwise, but this is something very different from one, two, three, four, page one, page two, page three, page four. Uh, what does this mean? And the second thing is there are things in the text which are not represented, obviously, in the illumination, and this is also super fascinating. According to the book of Revelation, they are really coming out like in a modern romance, crawling out of a book. So, uh, uh, or the first writer is told he is given a crown. So he, in your text, he already wears a crown, but he is not. So he's given a crown means that probably, probably this crown is given to him from the throne of God. This is not represented in the image. So this is just two or three things. I, I So this is not that I want to show you uh, uh, that your analysis is wrong, but this is uh, uh, I want to show you how much the, the other way around could maybe be uh, help you to find even more fascinating things. Oh, so oh. thank you, Francisca. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I would add in the in this line that. Uh, it's interesting also that for this history of the recession, that the first rider is interpreted like uh, uh, you said, uh, the people of God, but also uh, uh, it could understand as Jesus. Mm -hmm. not, all, not all the scholars thought that the first rider is Jesus. Uh, it's something that is discussed, but it's true that here, perhaps, uh, you can perceive this this, repre this representation, not only the people of God, but perhaps Jesus. You have to see if at the end of the Book of Revelation, the representation of the of the Son of God, like um, a, a rider again. I don't know if in the in the Beatus is, but perhaps you can compare the two images. Good. Thank you very much for those questions and comments. Um, illuminating and very helpful for, I hope, for Franci and certainly for me. I've learned a lot during the session. So thank you, Francisca, and thanks to all, everyone who asked questions and, and gave comments. Um, I just, to, to honor the time, I know we're two minutes over, but I just wanted to 
uh, quickly uh, recall or help you recall that in the future, uh, we are not going to have another presentation until February the 1st, uh, when uh, Tobias Niklas is going to be giving a talk on the Bamberg apocalypse. So we'll continue on uh, in a similar theme. Uh, in general, we, we try to go with the first Thursdays in a month, uh, but you'll see in a minute that this is not always the case. Then March 7th, um, we will be having two sessions, which are going to be hybrid, but we can all join by Zoom if you wish. Uh, Sam Pomeroy from Münster is going to be looking at the, the 20th century German theological uh, pre-war reception of the idea of the heavenly Jerusalem from Revelation. And then later in the same day, Anne Matter from Philadelphia will be talking about the reception of Revelation and the Song of Songs from the 5th to the 10th century. Uh, on the 21st, Regis Brunet will be giving uh, a, a short history of 666. People are already wondering if he's going to be talking about 616 as well. Uh, <laughs> And uh, finally, on May 2nd, uh, Martina Vercesi from Glasgow is going to be talking about her recent monograph on uh, the reception of the last three chapters, or actually of, of 19 through 21 of Revelation uh, in early Christianity and especially in the North African context. So it's still a full docket for the rest of the season uh, and continuing uh, going into a bit of a holiday pause, but then resuming again in February. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, email me or Christian Cardozo or Regis Brené, or join us on Facebook or Twitter, uh, and we will get back to you as quickly as we can about it, everything and anything you might want to ask or propose. That's about it. Thanks everyone for joining and see you around.